Hi, I'm Lloyd Pye. For the past 13 years, I've worked with doctors, geneticists, and other scientific experts trying to solve one of the world's great mysteries. The Starchild skull is an actual bone skull that has virtually nothing in common with a human skull. It was discovered around 1930 in a mine tunnel in the Copper Canyon region of Mexico, beside a human female skull we use for comparison. Carbon-14 dating confirms that both died about 900 years ago. The Starchild skull's physical traits and its genetic structure are so extensively different from a normal human, at a bare minimum it will be considered a new species and potentially even an extraterrestrial alien. Since 1999, our goal has been to answer two astonishing questions about it. What on earth is the Starchild skull and is it even from Earth? Many amateurs and credentialed professionals insist the Starchild skull was a human that suffered an extreme illness or deformity. Other experts discount that because they, unlike most critics, actually examine the skull. Those hands-on experts overwhelmingly agree the Starchild is completely unique and it does not fit the known profiles for any genetic variation or congenital defect. A common misconception about deformity is that genetic variation can produce any kind of physical alteration. This is wrong because survival past conception depends on genetic variations that fall within very narrowly defined parameters. Extensive physical and or genetic variations are always fatal, and in the Starchild's case we know from partial DNA recoveries that its genome contains vastly more genetic variations than any human could possibly survive. Despite our best efforts to present the truth about the Starchild, misinformation persists on the internet, including allegations that DNA recoveries have shown it to be 100% human, that its flat rear was caused by cradle boarding or some other cranial binding, that the expanded parietal bones at its sides were caused by hydrocephaly, and that its general weirdness was caused by progeria. Cradle boarding was a widespread practice in primitive cultures around the world. Infants would be swaddled onto a board carried on their mother's back as she did her daily work. To support their weak necks, infants' heads were loosely strapped down. Extensive resting of the rear of the head against the cradle board slowly deformed the soft skull bones until they were as flat as the board. A perfect example of cradle boarding is the human female found with the star child. The rear of her skull is bored flat from the top of the crown to just above the inion, the knob of bone at the lower rear of every human's head where neck muscles attach to our skulls and prevent further flattening. In contrast, the Starchild skull has no inion and its flattening extends well past where its inion should be. Also, any method of artificially shaping infant skulls leaves unmistakable evidence on their soft bones, and no such evidence is found on the Starchild's clearly convoluted bones, as observed by Dr. Ted Robinson. In addition, if the star child had ever been cradleboarded, even once, the angle of the skull's downward tilt would be so extreme it would have choked to death in minutes and never would have reached adulthood, which we know it did. Therefore, no smooth flattening plus no choking hazard equals the star child was not cradleboarded. Another misguided explanation that tries to account for the star child's physical anomalies centers on the bulging parietal bones at the sides of its head. Skeptics insist those must result from hydrocephaly, which causes excess spinal fluid to collect in or around the brain, which expands the skull uniformly, like a balloon. The first areas to expand are the suture lines, created by the disconnected edges of several bone plates that comprise an infant's skull, and which gradually close during its first two years to eventually fit together like puzzle pieces. In the Starchild skull, all of its sutures join normally with no signs of separation, which by itself rules out any form of hydrocephaly. In addition, notice that a three-way junction of sutures actually dips inward. Could a balloon be blown up with a crease on its surface? No, and neither could the Starchild, unless its three-way plate junction was fused solid rather than closed normally. This is a standard CAT scan showing none of its cranial sutures were fused, a fact Dr. John Baczynski, a radiology expert, confirms. An inward crease plus no fused sutures equals the star child did not have hydrocephaly. 
The most recent favorite among skeptics trying to explain away the star child is progeria, a highly complex, inevitably fatal condition that causes infants to grow old at an extremely accelerated rate. Hopeful critics point out that one of the star child's projected facial features, its greatly reduced lower face, is similar to the facial reduction seen in progeria victims. However, the skulls of progeria victims are innately human, while the star child is not. There is no way to fit the star child skull into the head of a progeria victim because their physiognomy is so different. Another progeria symptom found in the star child is thin bone, but the similarity ends there. As progeria thins out its victim's bones, it greatly weakens them, whereas the star child's thin bone is two or three times harder than normal human bone. In fact, biochemically, it's more like human tooth enamel. Also, in progeria victims, the fontanelle, the soft spot at the top of the head, nearly always remains open until death, while the star child's is clearly closed. So, extremely hard bone plus a closed fontanelle equals the star child did not have progeria. Thirteen years of struggle to decipher the riddle of the star child skull make clear that nothing about it is simple or easy. Yet today we know several things about it with a high degree of certainty. It did not miraculously survive massive DNA disruptions that would kill any normal human shortly after conception. Its head was not cradle boarded. It did not suffer from hydrocephaly or any other congenital defect. And it most clearly did not suffer from progeria. With those issues settled, let's turn to DNA. In the Star Child's case, three rounds of DNA testing have occurred. One was in 1999, the Stone Age of DNA testing, which concluded that the Star Child was a human male. Four years later, in 2003, that original test was thoroughly discredited by a far more sophisticated series of tests that indicated the Star Child was a hybrid being with a human mother and a non-human father. Finally, in 2010 and 2011, state-of-the-art tests have shown that both of the earlier tests produced flawed results because the star child's DNA was much too unusual to be handled by those antiquated procedures. Despite the latest test results, people frequently tell me they've heard or read that the star child's DNA was proved to be 100% human. Critics doggedly insist the earlier results provide reliable confirmation that the star child is human. This gross factual error is widely dispersed across the internet because skeptics wrongly believe that if any sample of unknown DNA has any part that resembles human DNA, the sample is automatically from a human. This isn't just wrong, it's absurdly wrong. Human DNA is widely shared with dozens of other species. Chimps share 97% of their genome with humans. Gorillas, 95%. Rats, 70%. Mice, 65%. And even fruit flies share 60%. Therefore, a few strings of base pairs of star child DNA that happen to match human DNA does not mean it's entirely human, not by a mile. One absolute truth that everybody everywhere can count on is that no DNA recovered from the star child thus far actually proves it is 100% human. To grasp the basics of this debate, we need to understand that all humans have two types of DNA. Nuclear DNA comes from both parents and gives us our individuality. Mitochondrial DNA comes from our mothers only and it allows each of us to be compared to other humans who share certain genetic affinities. The initial recovery of the star child's nuclear DNA produced several dozen fragments containing more than 30,000 base pairs, the steps in the twisted ladder of DNA. In half of those fragments, the base pairs could be matched exactly to similar fragments in the human genome. However, the other half could not be matched to any currently known species. These results are preliminary, requiring much repetitive testing for absolute verification. And if they were the only unusual results, they would be interesting but not totally compelling. However, they're far from the only unusual results. In humans, the 16,569 base pairs in our mitochondrial DNA carry a specific upper limit of variations, 120. 
Thus, every human has 120 or fewer variations in their mitochondrial DNA. Neanderthals have around 200 variations. The new prehuman, Denisovans, have 385. For every species, these numbers are solidly established, and they change extremely slowly over very long periods of time. With the star child's mitochondrial DNA, four recovered fragments add up to 9.5% of the human total. They contain 93 base pair variations. If we extrapolate 93 out to 100%, it creates a statistically acceptable bracket of 800 to 1,000 base pair differences in the star child compared to a human's 120 maximum. Thus, these two genomes cannot remotely be related. They're apples and lemons. Moving the star child even farther from humans is the recent recovery of a 211 base pair fragment recovered from the star child's FOXP2 gene. In humans, the FOXP2 gene is essential for formation of our brains, numerous internal organs, and our ability to speak. This all-important gene contains 2,594 base pairs, and in every normal human, each of those base pairs is absolutely identical. Here in blue, we see the 211 base pair fragment of human FOXP2 compared to the star child's fragment in black, along with fragments of several other species. The key things to notice here are the red letters among the star child's fragment, each of which denotes a single base pair variation. There are 56. Remember, normal humans have no variations in their entire FOXP2 gene and certainly none in the 211 base pair fragment found in the star child. But rhesus monkeys do have two such variations, mice 20, dogs 27, elephants 21, opossums 21, frogs 26. And then we have the star child's towering 56. Remember, this FOXP2 result, like the previous two, is partial. All three require additional DNA testing to establish absolute confirmation. Yet because all three are so highly anomalous relative to normal humans, we can be confident they will prove the star child's genome bears no relation to the human genome. Apart from DNA, we have physical evidence that confirms the star child is not human. If we consider 25 tangible points of reference on the human skull and the star child skull, not a single match can be found, not one. Even more remarkable is that some of those variations are unprecedented on Earth. The human eye socket is two inches deep, while the star child's is only one half inch deep, a 75% reduction with a completely altered shape. Human eye sockets can have noticeable depth reductions if they have abnormal fusions in their cranial sutures, but a CAT scan has revealed that the star child did not have any fused sutures. Also, every astronaut who has spent more than a month in space acquired small but measurable reductions in the depth of their eye sockets. All humans have a brow ridge, which the star child lacks. Its brain is one-third larger than a human of its size. What should be 1,200 cubic centimeters is in fact 1,600. It has no frontal sinuses, another key aspect of human speech. A human skull balances at two-thirds toward its rear, behind the center of its neck. The star child skull balances at its center of cranial volume, directly above the center of its neck, which is much smaller than a human neck and oval rather than circular. In humans, the cerebellum in the blue circle is securely tucked into the curve at the rear of the skull. In the star child, its extra brain mass presses down at a steep angle that would squeeze a human brain out of the foramen magnum, the hole where the spine enters the skull. This has led some experts to speculate that the star child's brain might well be made of a denser material than human brains. The star child had very small cheekbones and correspondingly small chewing muscles. A fragment of the star child's maxilla, its upper jaw, reveals a mouth the size of an infant's that contained a full set of adult teeth, although only two remained intact. Those two teeth were worn to an extent not possible for a child and also seem unlikely in an adult with such reduced chewing capacity due to its greatly reduced chewing muscles. This has led to speculation that the star child might possibly grow multiple sets of teeth 
during a greatly expanded lifetime. On the surface of human bone are many small pits called lacunae, which are an essential factor in the biological functioning of all vertebrate bone. Yet the star child bone contains no lacunae. Also, the star child's bone is much thinner than human bone, but it is much more durable. One reason for that durability is seen in magnified cross sections, which show that microscopic fibers have successfully resisted a cutting blade. These fibers are embedded in the star child's bone like the steel rebar that reinforces concrete. Mycologists have ruled out fungi, moles, yeast, and bacteria. These fibers are a natural part of the star child's bone and nothing like them has ever been found in any other bone from any other creature on earth. Another discovery unique to the star child is a reddish residue in its cancellous holes. This is not bone marrow, which in all species is consumed by bacteria after death. Whatever this residue is, it resisted the natural organisms that consume post-mortem tissue, which makes it, too, one of a kind on Earth. Altogether, the extensive physical evidence we've gathered combines with the compelling DNA evidence to strongly indicate the star child skull is not from a human and it may well be from beyond Earth. However, to prove that radical claim to a level no critic or skeptic can challenge, we have to secure a complete genome recovery. When we do that, it will be one of the greatest milestones in human history. Unfortunately, no endeavor of such size and importance can be completed without support. If you have found this video compelling and would like to help us by spreading the word about it, or in some other more direct way, please visit StarChildProject.com.